Good evening. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to your great university. I came to, the, to England uh, two days ago, having flown 11 hours with my family and my, uh, my sister who lives here in England. And um, this morning I woke up and discovered I was still having some jet lag. And I wondered, what would I do? So I said, okay, let me write down something, scribble something together. Typically, I walk around and speak from my heart. But I was afraid I could get a brain freeze in the middle of it. And I did not want that to happen in front of my, my son and my daughter this evening. And they will laugh at me. So I quickly put down something and I shall read to you this evening. I hope you don't mind. But uh, students and faculty, I, I feel very honored to be with you this evening. While I was coming here, I walked up the stairs and saw the types of people that I've spoken to you here. And I wondered in my heart, who am I to be here? But well, I'm Bennett, Bennett O'Malley. So please, take me just as I am. I've traveled around the world. I've spoken at so many universities. Last year, I gave about 70 speeches. I've met so many people, including those who collapsed when they shook my hand. I'm a nobody. I'm as ordinary as each and every one of you here. I was born in 1968 during the Nigerian Biafran War. I was born a refugee. Why my parents chose to conceive me in a time of war as refugees, I do not know. But I give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe, as refugees, sex was the only reasonable recreational activity for them. <laughs> But, but my mother, as I expected, my sister will confirm that, suffered the traumas of war, especially when starvation was weaponized as a weapon of war. And I was born in a dilapidated hospital in the jungles of eastern Nigeria. In fact, the day I was born, my father was a victim of the numerous but bad men. And you could imagine how a dilapidated hospital in Watan, Africa would look like. But I was born. And in the same hospital, my father laid dying on a bed. But about two weeks later, for some magical reason, his clinical status turned around, and I was presented to him to behold his son before he passed her. And he gave me the name Bennett, from Benoit, to be blessed. He gave me the middle name Ifakando, a Nigerian name, which means that life is the greatest gift of all. For I was a blessing unto his life. And there he was dying, but I was coming into the world, that life, is the greatest gift. I suffered malnutrition in the first three, four years of my life. And then to add to the trauma of war I suffered, I grew up in one of the most corrupt countries, most corrupt societies known to my Nigeria. So as I got older, I'm not ashamed to say, well, you could see I'm not reading from the notes I made. <laughs> So I will get on. If I forget what I have to say, I'll, re I'll refer to my reading notes. So I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it. I, I struggled with depression. I struggled with depression all my life into my adulthood. I had such a low self-esteem. I felt so inadequate. 
I felt everybody was better than me. But in, in the most difficult times of your life, in the darkest moments of your life, these times could be your best opportunities and platforms to discover who you are, to reaffirm who you are. And yes, I did. In the darkness of my loneliness, I discovered the light of life itself. I discovered that, yes, I could be depressed. Yes, I could be a nobody with no sense of self. But I was Bennett Omalu. I was an individual. I came to the world alone, and I shall die alone. Nobody would leave with me. I discovered that there can never be another Bennett or Malu throughout all eternity, throughout the history of mankind. There shall never be another me. Therefore, this was my only life, my only stage, my only time to be me. That I shall not live my life at the mercy of someone else's conscience or to be like someone else, or to live my life according to the expectations of society. It was okay to be me. It was okay to be depressed. It was okay to feel inadequate. As long as it is my life to live, that I shall not live by the expectations of society. I am Bennett Amalo. You may be Jennifer Thomas, Aman Mohan, Adamu Musa Ibrahim, whatever your name may be. You are unique. You are wonderfully made. Without you, mankind shall not be complete. So the best contribution you could make to mankind is to simply be yourself. You may be short or tall, dark or light, smart or not smart, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And as long as you are yourself, not like someone else, you shall never be a loser in life. But the mistake we make is that we choose to conform to the expectations of society, to let society define who we are. So you become like someone else. Don't do that to yourself. I refused and I rejected that. That was when my depression began to leave me. The moment I accepted myself for what I was and for what I am. And in my struggles, in trying to understand my predicament, I discovered what I called conformational intelligence. What is conformational intelligence? You wouldn't see it any t in any textbook. I did not find it anywhere. I coined it myself. Conformational intelligence is a phenomenon whereby your mentality, your intuition, the perception of your environment, the way you think, your intelligence, the cast of your mind is controlled and determined by expectations of society, without you even being aware of it. Without you even knowing it. And once you've, um, you become embedded in a cast of the mind, 
presented to you by society, you hold on to it without you even being aware of it. And then when objective evidence is presented to you to dispute or refute the cast of your mind, you engage in cognitive dissonance because you want to remain invested in the cast of your mind. And when that objective evidence is sustained and presented to you, what do you do? You become emotional. You become tribal. And you reject it. Sometimes you become violent. without you even knowing it. And I've traveled around the world talking to leaders of industry. How much is, um, how much is conformational intelligence holding us down as a people, constricting us, constraining creativity, constraining originality and innovativeness? I went to business school, one of the top business schools of the world, Carnegie Mellon University. I'm a physician. I did not do so well in business school because it was a quantitative business school. It was based on calculus. I was such a terrible business uh, school student. But I remember the first month of business school, one thing I learned was the so-called central limit theorem. The central limit theory. What is that? It's very basic mathematics. It's actually the foundation of mathematics and statistics. That in whatever measurable human index, 96 to 97% of us will be within plus or minus three standard deviations of a certain expectation. We, as human beings, as a species of mammals, have a tendency to cluster together and homogenize ourselves. And about three to four percent of us in every measurable human index are outlying. But do you know what we as societies have always done to outliers? People who have refused to conform to a certain expectation of whatever measurable human index. As a society, we ostracize outliers. We discriminate against outliers. We expel them, we expunge them, simply because they do not belong. But now you look at information technology industry. Who are the ones who've moved that industry forward? Outliers. So is it time for us to begin to change the way we are to become less conformational? Being an outlier is a good thing. Not belonging is wonderful. Not being part of the majority or part of the many is a good thing. As long as you remain true to who you are, it is okay. It is okay. You remain true to who you are. You manifest yourself. And because there is no other you throughout all eternity, that is your best opportunity to contribute to mankind. Because there is no other you. So the best thing that could happen to us as a society is to let each and every one of us be. The best thing I could do for us all is to be myself. And same applies to each and every one of us here. The best thing you could do for me is to be yourself. 
not to be like me. Because when you're like me, you're denying mankind of the creativity that lies within you, which is only unique to you. I'm a forensic pathologist. You ask my daughter, Ashley, what's the, what does daddy do for a living? She'll tell you daddy cuts up dead people. <laughs> yes, that is what I do for a living. It's not very glamorous. In fact, not many of you knew who I was until Will Smith came into my life and glamorized what I did. But as a scientist and as a pathologist, I've performed over 12,000 autopsies. Think about it. I've caught up over 12,000 people. I practice the science of death. The science of death. How unattractive. But through my science, my brothers and sisters, through my science, I discovered faith. I practice my science in my faith, and my faith in my science. Again, the expectation of society is to make you believe that faith and science are antagonistic and diametrically opposed. That is as far from the truth as you could have it. Science is a human endeavor that seeks the truth through scientific methods. But you would notice, as scientists, the more you discover in science, the more you realize what you do not know. But you keep the faith on science, and you continue to search for the truth. There is only one truth. Truth doesn't have an alternative truth. Truth doesn't have a side or a perspective or perspective. There is only one truth. But through practicing the science of death, I discovered that when you die, the spirit inside you leaves your body. Your body is dead. That spirit that lives in the body, in the autopsy I performed on Friday before I left for England, is the same spirit that lives in me. Is the same spirit that lives in each and every one of us. There is a spirit that lives inside you. You may call it whatever, a battery, some force, some consciousness, some awareness, but it lives in you. And that same spirit that lives in you is the same spirit that lives in me, that lives in you, that lives in all of us. When you identify with that spirit, manifest that spirit. Recognize that spirit. Live up to the hopes and aspirations of that spirit. That is what I call faith. Religion is not faith. Religion is a tenant of faith. And that faith is in search of the truth of who you are. And since there is only one truth, you can now see the amalgamation or confluence of science and faith, the truth. So you see that science and faith are synergistic. But what has happened today is that society expects you to manifest your faith only through religion, to divide us. 
Do not live up to the expectations of society. We all are one family of mankind. I wake up in the morning, I look into the mirror, I see myself. I step out of my door, I see you. I behold you. I see myself in you. So whatever I do to you, I do to myself. Whatever I do to you, I do to all of us. Because we are all members of that one common spirit that binds us together as the family of mankind, the humanity of mankind. So whatever we do, even to the least of us, we do to all of us. But don't get me wrong. The truth could be inconvenient. The truth could be painful. But we should not deny the truth because of its inconvenience and develop alternative truths. That is founded upon fear. Do not be afraid. Fear can only lead you to darkness and destruction. Very lately, you would hear people deny that humanity we all share together. That one common family, one love, one hope, one joy, one happiness, one home, and one earth. Some people are denying that truth, that we all are members of one another. And are coming up with the so-called nationalism and ethnic politics. It is driven by fear. And you would know that such people are usually the loudest and the noisiest. They are usually the most bombastic. They are driven by fear. Fear of the truth of who we are as one common family of mankind. It was this discovery of mine of faith through my science that led me to Mike Webster on a cold, chilly, dark Saturday morning in September of 2002. Up on the Allegheny Mountains of Western Pennsylvania, I was doing an autopsy on a man called Mike Webster who had played American football for 17 years. And after his retirement, the poor man was suffering. His family suffered. As I walked up to his body that morning to introduce myself to him, I called him by his name, Mike. I saw myself in Mike. He suffered, I suffered. And I said to Mike, I shall use all my knowledge, my education, and my science to vindicate you and your family, to help you. Because I knew if I helped him, I was helping myself, and I was not proving wrong. So it was faith that led me to the discovery of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I practiced my faith in my science, my science in my faith. In my journey of faith, when I don't have all the answers, I don't turn my back on faith. Just like I don't turn my back on science when I don't have all the answers. Today, we don't have a cure for cancers, of Alzheimer's disease. Have we all turned our backs on science? No. So why the double standard? When it comes to faith, whenever we don't have all the answers in faith, the first thing we do is to turn our back on faith and reject faith. And reject the truth that we all are members of one another. White, black, yellow, pink, no matter what your ethnicity may be. It was faith that led me to chronic traumatic encephalopathy. But guess what? I was in my 30s. I was only three months removed from my training as a neuropathologist. When I made my discovery and published it, what happened to me? You thought the world would have rejoiced with me. No. 
I was expelled by the colleges of medicine in America that I was a voodoo doctor, that I was a dangerous doctor, because I was not the expected discoverer. For crying out loud, I was an African young, I had no name in pathology. I was not the expected discoverer of a mighty disease, especially in the most popular sport in America. So what did doctors in America do? They engage in conformational intelligence. I was an outlier, and I was ostracized. Even very prominent doctors, the best universities in America, rejected my work, denied my work, and dismissed me. Just like society has always done with outliers. But I kept my faith. Because I knew that it was not about me. It was about that one love we all share together. In whatever you do, may your objective be to strive to enhance the humanity of another person. When you do that, I guarantee you, you shall be extremely successful. It is not an easy road to travel, but nothing good comes easy. The more difficult it is, the greater the outcome and the results. So the question I ask you today is how much is conformational intelligence controlling your life, influencing you, making you feel so miserable? Think about it. How much are you denying yourself of being you because of what society says? No human being born on this earth is greater than you because you're a child of the universe just like that other human being. When society tells you you're less than, say, no, 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 I am me. Speak your truth quietly, clearly. But recognizing you're one of many. You're one of that family of mankind. Don't be invested on you. Invest on that family. Now listen to this. Yesterday I was at BBC. They interviewed me. In 1957, 11 years before I was born, I've given away my age. It's okay. I'm old now. The American Academy of Pediatrics published a position paper in the Pennsylvania Medical Journal in 1957 that no child under the age of 12 should engage in American football, wrestling, or boxing. In 2011, the American Academy of Pediatrics, now with the Canadian Society of Pediatrics, published a position paper that physicians should begin to guide children and parents away from all types of contact sports where there is intentional exposure to blows to the head. In the past three or four years, papers, scientific papers, have been published in the hundreds and thousands to show that even after one season of playing American football, ice hockey, mixed martial arts, rugby, boxing, wrestling, only after one season that a child has suffered irreversible brain damage. We wake up in the morning, we do things that enhance our humanity. Some of us would pray, some of us would meditate, some of us would jog, some of us would read a book. You do things that improve your humanity. Can somebody tell me who wakes up in the morning, puts on a helmet and slams his head on the wall? <laughs> but that is what we make our children do every day on the face of the earth. And we choose to reject, ignore the science because we want to conform to the traditions, cultures, and norms of society. Says who? And then when a doctor like myself speaks the truth, 
Amata. I've been called all types of names. We are a species. By science, we evolve. It is who we are to change. But luckily, true mutational changes over the centuries, luckily for us, thankfully, as we evolve, we become more intelligent. So as we become more intelligent, we give up the less intelligent ways of our past. Less than 50 years ago, we would have been smoking in this hall. We are more intelligent now. We don't do that. Not too many years ago, children used to walk. Today, we don't do that in modern society. Not too far long ago, women couldn't walk and couldn't do certain things. We're more intelligent today, we've changed that. Why is sports different? Why is sports different? Does it make sense that a human being will use his head to stop a ball traveling at, um, say, 30 miles an hour? The human brain has no reasonable capacity to regenerate itself. Every trauma you suffer is permanent. For crying out loud, we're having less children. Yes, we are. So our children are becoming more precious. It's not a global market. Your children are beginning to compete with Chinese children, with Indonesian children, even with African children. So do we now subject a significant proportion of our less children to brain damage in contact sport? So by the time they are becoming adults, they are already intellectually compromised. That's a fact. A paper that came out of Sweden in 2016 stated that when a child suffers even one concussion, that that child has about a 600% increased risk of committing suicide. That child has about a 300 to 400% increased risk of developing psychiatric disorders as an adult, of becoming a drug addict, an alcoholic, of having mild behavioral impairments and mild cognitive impairments as an adult. Why are we intentionally damaging the brains of our children? What will make your child a leader in industry is not the number of goals he or she has scored or touchdowns. It's your intellectual capacity. But yet, we refuse to get it. We reject that truth. Because we want to conform to the lives of our past, the way we have done things in the past. It's time to change, especially beginning with a university like this. Beginning with a university like this. When I saw the changes in Mike Webster's brain, I did not have to go to, with, to, go to the four walls of a university to do my research. I did my research on my bed with my iPad because I had access to the libraries, including the British Library and the US Congressional Library. So today, a young man or woman does not have to go to a university to do research. So an individual who is not one of many, who is not one of the establishment, could be creative, could come up with discoveries. It is part of who we are as human beings to change, to embrace the limitless promise of the future. One person at a time, we need to begin to do that and not be afraid investing in the ways of the past. Together, as a family of mankind, we need to begin to support individuals who may have ideas that are different from us, even when we don't agree with it. Diversity is a good thing, not diversity by your skin color or ethnicity. 
diversity in thought, diversity in perception, diversity in perspective, diversity in judgment, diversity in government. Every dimension of our lives, we must embrace diversity because that is who we are. Each and every individual is different. Intelligence is not exclusive to any one of us or any one group. And like my life has shown, science and faith go hand in hand. And by faith, my brothers and sisters, by faith, the seemingly impossible shall become possible in your life, in my life, in our lives. And finally, hopefully, we shall discover a drug that will cure all cancers. Think about it. Discover a drug like we discovered penicillin. But it's not going to come from a university, like this university. You know why? Because our universities are now becoming colleges of conformational intelligence. Universities are now being governed by corporate cultures, corporate principles, corporate finance, and relegating creativity, ingenuity to the background. When I finish my fellowship, listen to this. I sit down. I applied for a job in the university I trained. I said I wanted to research traumatic brain injury. I was told no. The only position they had for me for, was a fellowship where I would research mutational profiling of tumors. Think about it. I wanted to research brain trauma. The corporate organizational structure of the university I was in said, no, we want you. I kept my faith and I said no, but I believed that by faith, the seemingly impossible will be possible. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for those fascinating opening remarks, which are very inspirational and uh, informative. Um, I want to ask why you think the NFL took so long to accept the change? Because it strikes me that they've lost the chance to reform or to work with the doctors and physicians. And instead now, uh, there's no way forward really for the NFL to continue in this case. Well, what I was doing, um my research, because remember I grew up in Nigeria, I was a total buffoon when it came to football, American football. So I was studying the NFL, and I discovered that the NFL was a corporation just like many other corporations, but that the mistake the NFL made was that the NFL and their commissioner said this in a press conference, that their business was about selling football. So systematically and systemically, they chose to ignore the humanity of football. So when I now came up with my proposition emphasizing the humanity of football, they became afraid. They became very agitated. And again, fear is a very negative emotion. And that was what you said. The NFL had a choice of inviting me in, as we speak, as I'm talking to you today, the NFL has never reached out to me. They called me a no-name Nigerian doctor. So what I did, I, I went to business school, so I came up with a, a strategy to present the humanity of football in competition with the business of football. And as I expect, that the humanity of football prevailed. And I'm not saying this lightly. I don't think football would survive another generation. No. We are becoming more intelligent. And with science moving forward, 
it's very basic common sense now. In fact, participation in football dropped by about 12% in California last year. It just doesn't make sense. And actually, I gave the NFL a window where I came publicly. I made a pronouncement that, look, football should stay for adults. Children shouldn't play. That was intentional on my part. So I'll give them some, a platform to emerge from. But they rejected that. So we evolve as a society. I think we'll come up with more brain-friendly sports for our children. And maybe not in my lifetime, but I, I don't see football surviving for another generation or two, so, which is their own mistake. And in fact, I think the commissioner, of, the commissioner of the NFL should have resigned because he's mismanaged this woefully. You mentioned for the example of a, a child heading a football in a game of you know, English football or soccer as being also dangerous to the, to the brain and to development. Uh, do you think it will be difficult to change not just the most openly contact or aggressive sports like American football, but even practice such as heading the football in soccer? Do you worry that actually people will react and saying you just want to stop all sports? No, no, not all sports. Um, sports, as long as you're an adult, you're free to play whatever sport you want to play. If you want to engage in skydiving, good for you, but not for children. So f for the less contact, less impact sports like soccer, my recommendation based on science is there should not be any heading of the ball for any child below the age of 18. One. Two, I actually went out to soccer fields to watch young children play soccer. Soccer is a high dexterity sport with very high visual spatial capacity. A seven-year-old child doesn't have that. And when you watch them, you'll notice they cluster around the ball. They're very sluggish. They're more likely to bump into one another. And they have to have their eyes on the ball before they kick. It's so all we should wait for children to develop sufficiently at about the age of 12 to 14 before they play soccer as we play it without the heading. For younger children, we should develop less contact, less dribble forms of soccer, okay? Now, some people like at the BBC yesterday said to me, oh, but if they don't play starting from childhood, they shall not uh, reach at the top performing level. That is not true. In the US military, you cannot join till you're 18. Has that in any way undermined the preparedness of the military? No. So if you so expose a child to repetitive blows to the head, beginning from four or five years, by the time that child is 18, he's already intellectually undermined. And is less likely to perform at his top level. So paradoxically, ironically, if you don't let them play and damage their brains as children, when they become adults, their brains are at its top form. So we may take soccer to levels we've never imagined. This is what is called visionary thinking. Things must not be the way they were in the past. And this is the scientific truth. The, the soccer industry actually doesn't have a choice. Otherwise, they'll be going against the truth. Develop their own alternative truths. But I ain't, ain't going to lead you nowhere. So I think we keep the emotions aside again, emotionality, cognitive dissonance. Let us come together objectively and protect our children. I want to ask about your experience of trying to bring scientific research into public discourse about something that's, you know, as American as, as it can be. Obviously, you've spoken about being pushed out of the medical community. Uh, did you find that there was sort of an anti-scientific pushback in general in the reaction that you got from media and from lobbying groups? Yes, you know, in America now, a significant proportion of Americans are becoming anti-science. I, I, I don't know the basis for that. But it is our duty as the scientists, as the physicians, to push back on that. And I think where we have failed, um, I don't know how many of us have read the book Capital in the 21st Century, 
by Thomas Pinketty. We actually had him speaking here just, uh-huh. just last May. Very brilliant guy, just like his book was too long. <laughs> <laughs> But in the first parts of the book, I don't know exactly the first page, but before page 40, I don't remember, <laughs> he used the word scientificity. Scientificity, meaning science just for the sake of science. And he said, scientificity would not lead you to anywhere. It's null and void. The rather, we should focus on the humanity of science. Science that enhances the shared humanity of all of us. So I think that um, social scientists should come in. They have a, a significant role to play people like you, whereby we humanize science. I've actually been criticized by my fellow colleagues that I'm not a typical doctor, just because I'm a public speaker. Who says doctors cannot speak? Doctors cannot be policy, uh, uh, social science advisors. Again, that confirmation of thinking. So I think as scientists, it's our duty to educate the public. You, you find it so amazing. The people who have attacked me the most in this journey have been my fellow doctors. I'm not kidding. My fellow doctors, many of them are associated with the sports industry, making millions of dollars from the status quo. They are the ones who have attacked me very vehemently and viciously. So I, I don't know, I think this is where the social scientists could come in to en- enhance the utility of science, to make science more practical and pragmatic. Uh, am I making sense? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Uh, which leads nicely on to my final question, which is, now that you're not, not a typical doctor, um, what do you think your next uh, causes are? Do you think you're still focused on the sports issue, or are there other uh, researches, research areas or campaigns you intend to focus on in the next years? Yes, well, what I've done, um, you know, you need to develop a strategy. So the first strategy I implemented was to remove myself from any organized institution. Because when you're a member of a university or some organization, they want to control you. You're not free to say whatever you want to say. So I formed my own practice, so I'm independent. And I, I formed uh, a corporation through which I apply for grants. I just uh, submitted an $8 million grant to the Department of Defense. I hope I get it. But I, I purchased the license to a patent. Um, to a radio ligand called FDDNP. So we've done clinical phases one and two. We now need about $8 million to complete phase three to identify diagnose CTE in living people. But the powers that be do not want us to succeed because this would not give you indisputable proof, especially for the military. That means if you scan somebody with FDDNP is a PET marker, if, you have, if it's positive, you can't send him back to Iraq or wherever. So we're, we're facing a, a very uphill battle. And another thing I'm doing, which doesn't need so much money, we are starting a clinical phase three trial to test a drug that um, inhibits the formation of tau in the brains of CTE sufferers. This is a drug that is currently in the market. It's a very old drug, but just like aspirin, aspirin is a very old drug, but it still has very modern day utilities. So there have been one, many wonderful drugs that were discovered many years ago. They fell out of favor, but we are beginning to bring them back because we are rediscovering new utilities for them. So these are the works I'm involved with now. Then I go around the world uh, giving talks. Um, in fact, co- more, more corporations invite me out to speak to their managers than universities. And everybody is interested in this confirmational intelligence. Um, a good example, there's a new CEO. No, no, there's a CEO. And some young kid in his 20s walks into his office one morning I wanted to share a new idea with him. He looked at the guy who let you into my office. How long have you been with this company? The kid said, 20, uh, said two weeks. He said, oh, no, 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 go and speak to your supervisor, then it will get to me. 
Why? Because it's only two weeks in your corporation. What are, you did not listen to the idea he had. Could that have been what would have made your company now a much, much, much valuable company? And again, another thing you notice in universities, when you see a group of researchers from the same department, I mean you have a group of physicists, the first thing you notice is that they all think alike. And they're usually under the lordship of a head of department. And the head of department, without knowing it himself, attracts only people he agrees with, people he likes or she likes. So before you know it, a department becomes homogenized in their intellect and mentality without even knowing it. it so these are things I'm doing now. Well, if you're not speaking to many universities, we're very grateful for you to come and speak <laughs> to us today. That's unfortunately all we have time for, but thank you so much for visiting thank us you, and for your insightful remarks. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.